Hello World Wide Web, I'm Decker Shadow, the internet personality with the best hair. And finally, after many months, we are going to be looking at the final, I do repeat, final film in the Power Rangers film franchise. And you all know what that means. Uh, you do realize that Hasbro is planning another reboot of the films, right? La 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 sheep like to eat grass and I do not hear anything about Power Rangers reboots for the foreseeable future. Glad to see you're handling this with your usual level of maturity. Let's get this over with, shall we? Uh, hang on, where's Jimmy Fulu? After all those interesting messages I received after neglecting to invite him for the last Power Rangers review, I thought for sure he would be here. Hmm, good point. Hey, Jimmy Fulu, what are your thoughts on the 2017 Power Rangers movie? Hmm, meh. Released in 2017, Saban's Power Rangers took the colorful kids' show of tokusatsu mixed with American studio meddling and turned it into a dark and gritty story about teenagers in bright colorful suits. But it's gritty now! It's a bit more complicated than that. True, but the more detail we go into, the longer we're going to be sitting here talking about Power Rangers, so let's just give the audience what they want. Damn it. A darker, more quote-unquote realistic take on Power Rangers wasn't the worst of ideas, given the fact that fans of the original had at this point grown up, and quite a few superheroes had been given a more gritty facelift in modern cinema. Following suit, Saban's Power Rangers works as a sort of origin story, telling the tale of how the Power Rangers came to be, and how they have to face off against Rita Repulsa in the biggest showdown yet for the big screen. Well, naturally, with her bugles bra, I can only imagine the damage she can do. Sorry, that didn't make the cut on the redesign. What the son of a... Why should I even bother watching that? <sighs> Let's take a look at Saban's Power Rangers and see if this movie can morph with the best of them. You can't just... So... Now? Not unless Dr. Ian Malcolm was right. And I don't think I want to live on a planet where that can happen. Well, let's just go with the writers don't know the difference between Cenozoic and Mesozoic and move on. The Yellow Ranger is here and... Rishenu. What the fuck is that? Well, she's not blue, but you finally have your naked alien woman. Lucky me. And hey, they don't have a Vietnamese woman playing the Yellow Ranger. Already, this movie is less racist than the source material. We also got Zordon here, who is the Red Ranger, and Brian Cranston, who's done up like Mystique. And naked. Well, he's blue and alien. Two out of three ain't bad. Teenagers with attitude. Again, teenagers with attitude. We've seen this part already. Get on with it. It had to be a cow. Couldn't be like a dog or something. Why? Well, I didn't mean that far. Also, that is our title card. Tiny little font on the lower right-hand corner. Did I mention this movie got over a hundred million dollars for its budget? Money well spent, since our last moments with Rita and Zordon show the latter being crushed under a falling meteorite, while Rita gets thrown into the ocean. Me personally? I'd drown, but what do I know? I'm sure she'll be just fine. I mean, it's no dumpster. We cut to modern-day Angel Grove, where the plot goes from a story about an ancient struggle between aliens on prehistoric Earth to one about a football jock who has just jerked off a bull. Creepy, enough with the sex jokes already. Well, was it one udder? Yeah. Yeah, that's not an udder, dude. I was gonna say, it was actually kinda weird. It was really big and I had to use two hands to stop. Yeah, this movie was given a PG-13 rating to appeal to a more mainstream audience. Let me be clear here. The film that was based off of a long-running children's franchise Opens on animal masturbation. I, uh, I, 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 I'm trying to figure out what to even say to that. So the prank of whatever the hell they're doing, evidently the bovine handy was just an added bonus, well, it gets the attention of the police, so they must run. Jason, played by Doc Ray Montgomery, hops in a truck, promptly backs into the police, and then a chase scene breaks out. Driving like a maniac, he flees from the long arm of the law. 
Okay, technically the other driver did just back into traffic without bothering to check. What the hell is even happening here? We've seen asylum films with better, more realistic car crashes. And again, a hundred million dollar budget! The crash did have some effect on Jason's life. We see that he's now under house arrest, complete with ankle bracelet, and a brace for the busted knee he incurred during said crash, as opposed to being splattered all over the landscape. Also, his father, played by David Denman, reads him the riot act in the school parking lot. Now you gotta come here every Saturday for the rest of the year just so you can graduate with all these other weirdos and criminals. Awful strange time to spout exposition. Could have yelled at him on the way over, or during breakfast. He's explaining it for the audience. Also rude much? The weirdos, as his father so eloquently put it, include Billy, played by R.J. Seiler. He's a bit different, so naturally bullies bully him! But don't worry, Jason is there to stop them. Did you just slap me? I did. And you don't want to know what else he's done with that hand. We really don't. Let's just hope his dad didn't drive by a pasture on the way to detention. Also serving detention is Kimberly, played by Naomi Scott. Her reason for being here will come up later. For now, her friends on the pep squad have shown up to let Kim know that she's no longer one of them. Using visual aids, just in case Kimberly doesn't understand nuance. You can show up for cheer practice if you want, but I wouldn't. Okay, are they setting this up as a slasher movie? Because I know this is high school, but even the mean girls didn't go this far. Next thing we know, they're going to establish Angel Grove is in Maine. I was kidding! The story said in Maine, of course, there's nowhere else to live with the Rangers and Zordon too. Some bullies and Alpha Five. Rita Revolta. Stop it! So help me God, if the Rangers end up fighting Stephen King's it's... Actually, no, that would be pretty awesome. Anyway, as thanks for slapping the bully silly, Billy wants to be best buds with Jason. They can hang out together! Except, of course, for that tracker and the house arrest, but don't worry, Billy can bypass the SIM card on it no problem! And break federal law in the process, but eh. Thus, Jason zooms down the road on his trusty bike, Silver! God damn it, more Stephen King. Well, he makes it to Billy, Billy hacks the tracker, and he's free. Seriously, the tracker absolutely never comes up again for the rest of the movie. Hey, that's status quo for this franchise. I mean, did the cops ever do anything besides recruit teenagers? Billy asks Jason to drive him to the Rock Quarry. I mean, there's Dave and Buster's, Chuck E. Cheese, any mall on the planet. Hey, it's where all the happening kids are hanging out these days, including the last two rangers who haven't even been introduced yet. Unfortunate, but true. Trini, played by Becky G, is performing yoga while listening to death metal. Seems like an odd choice, but all right. Whereas Zack, played by Ludie Lin, is slumming inside of an abandoned train car. Kimberly has shown up as well to complete the quintet, stripping down to her underwear for some fan service, but also so she can... What the hell did I just watch? I don't know. It's like they took a still image of her with her arms raised and then flipped it so that it looked like she was diving into the water. Badly. This does mean that Kimberly is exposed enough to have sexual tension between her and Jason. I mean, they don't. These guys have the chemistry of a room temperature egg McMuffin, but the intent is there. Whereas Amy Jo Johnson and Jason David Frank could fog up a cathode ray tube any day of the week. I repeat, on a children's show. While these two are struggling to light a match, much less make sparks fly, Billy is off on his own setting up some high-powered explosives! That didn't work. Where's the kaboom? There was supposed to be an earth-shattering kaboom! Ah, there it is. And the body count rises. Oh, hey! Wow! What are you doing, dude? I've been digging up here for some years! Hey. 
Sorry, Decker. Plot armor strikes again. It seems Billy just kinda has a knack for handling heavy explosives, but the blast was loud enough to alert everyone in the area, who come running to see what all the commotion is about. This place is a restricted area! It could have fooled me, what with all the teenagers running around and, oh yeah, no authority figures. <laughs> and the body count rises. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. How? Decker, you have got to stop assuming that people will die just because it doesn't make sense for them not to. That statement makes absolutely no sense to me. And I've sat through Steven Seagal flex. The rock slide reveals an obsidian glass wall and encased inside some mysterious gems. Or, well, they call them coins for some reason, but these things look more like chaos emeralds if you ask me. Either way, Zack wastes no time hacking away at the priceless discovery to nab the tokens. As luck would have it before the authorities arrive. See, the explosion was loud, so they must run! Fleeing as fast as they can, a chase scene breaks out! Again! Somebody's gonna die! Are they trying to chase the kids down with forklifts? I would suggest the steamroller, but I really don't want to see that somehow not work. Speaking of the teens surviving things that no one should by any logic ever, they try to play chicken against a train once everyone has climbed aboard inside the van. Okay, now they have to be dead. There's no way that all five teenagers just magically... <sighs> Given that they've survived two brushes with death so far, I can't tell if it's because they have their ranger powers now, or if the editing crew was just wasted. At this point, I'm starting to wonder if I slipped in a Final Destination sequel by accident. While this was going on, we see Jason's father out fishing, as in commercial fishing, but this haul is more than just fish or boots in the odd tin can. Nope, they found a friggin' corpse as well, so they just leave it in the freezer with the fish. Because mackerel tastes so much better when it's augmented with mysterious ancient dead woman undertones. I do not envy the automated advertisements Google's gonna send you after that line. Back with the kids, we see not only did they survive, but they're experiencing a Spider-Man-esque realization of their superpowers, recovering from injuries very quickly, as well as having super strength and durability. No, no, no. Oh. Okay. Even without morphing. Which raises the question, what exactly is the point of morphing now? Well, there's the roll call. Mastodon! Pterodactyl! Triceratops! Saber-tooth tiger! Tyrannosaurus! Which they don't actually do at any point in this film. That makes me sad. There's also the fact that putting more than two Chaos Emeralds together causes random shit to happen. Okay, if the emeralds, uh, coins, whatever, if they have enough heat to do that, they probably should have just melted through the countertop long before it got that bad. You're complaining about metaphysics and Power Rangers again, Decker. We've talked about that. Jason, Billy, and Kim decide to head back to the quarry after school so they can look for answers. Zack is there as well, just because as is Trini, because she's the most misunderstood of the misunderstood loners in this movie. They all talk about how they feel so much stronger now. Yeah, I feel like I could jerk off ten bulls! Is that why you moved to the countryside? No, 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 no it's, 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 it's Jason, he... Never mind, what happens next? Next, they all jump off a cliff. Yes, really. Is this supposed to be one of those group trust exercises? If it is, I don't like Billy's chances. Huh, feels more like a cult initiation all of a sudden. Once the entire group has made it to the lake under the ground inside of the ravine, their arcade tokens begin to resonate, making them glow all sorts of colors! I'm black! What? I am. No, you're not! More on the nose than the original series, and yet, still less racist. 
Well, that's actually one thing they realized they could do better than the Mighty Morphin era. The pool they're in also has a mysterious barrier beneath. Or, well, it's less of a barrier and more of a portal a la the Abyss or Stargate, which leads to a mysterious spaceship. Which is more than a little obviously the command center, but more H.R. Geiger inspired this time around instead of Jewish University. What the hell is that? Alpha 5? They pretty much lived in the command center? Well, hold up! Just a minute. Why? Do they look like that? Calm down, Decker. I know you're not the biggest fan of CGI, but... Do you not see this naked cyborg gremlin from hell in front of you? Alpha 5, voiced by Bill Hader, manages to corral all the kids from the main room to meet Zordon, who has been dead for eons, sadly, but lives on as the ship's giant floating head. Look! It's Zordon! I guess we wouldn't have figured that out on our own without that naked gremlin pointing it out to us. Hello. In this case, that might have been necessary. Zordon does the best with what he has, looking like Max Headroom's poorly rendered cousin trapped in the ship's massive pin art board, to explain to the teenagers that they are in fact Power Rangers, and the only ones capable of saving the world. Oh yeah, the world needs saving again. Now you must protect the Zeo Crystal and life on Earth. Maybe you should have opened with that one, Zordon. Somehow the giant floating head and streaking gremlin aren't all that convincing to the kids, so Zordon resorts to visual aids. Dig. Dig. Okay, main, small town, dark secrets, ancient evil, helpful older character, psychic powers, died. That's seven shots right there. Stop! This is not a Stephen King movie, and we've never actually established that it takes place in Maine. Well, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck. Rita Repulsa, played by Elizabeth Banks, appears to terrify the kids. But it was all just a dream, a vision of things to come. Now, with that out of the way... Whoa, what are you doing? No, 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 come back! They just say fuck it and leave. Fate of the world in the balance, 11 days until it all ends. Eh. I get that refusing the call is part of the hero's journey, but that sounded pretty important. And we're an hour into the movie. Before Jason can leave, Zordon has him hang back for a little more exposition that will hopefully change his mind. Rita was the Green Ranger, but betrayed her team and turned evil. However, it will take some time for her to return to full strength. If Jason can lead the new Rangers as a team, they might be able to stop her. Okay. I'm leaving. Could one of you kids maybe be into the idea of being a superhero? Last time I saw this much apathy towards the idea of being a destined hero as part of an SNL skit. And I'm here wondering when we're gonna get some Power Rangers in this Power Rangers movie. Huh. So that's what that feels like. At the very least, the last thing Zordon tells Jason, that he was literally born to do this, does kind of stick with him, and he tells the rest of the teens, hey, leader or not, he can't tell them what to do, but he's coming back here tomorrow. With that out of the way, we take a break to establish Zack's home life. He cares for his mother. That's nice. Uh, also, Trini has a family too. Who to thunk it? Me and four kids from Angel Grove found a spaceship buried underground. Oh, pee in that cup! Trini's home life consists of mandatory drug tests over breakfast. I get why she hangs out at the quarry. Now, wasn't there a bad guy in this movie? Or is she still literally sleeping with the fishes? Actually, no. Rita managed to escape from a freezer, displaying more competence here than she did while encased in a space dumpster on the show. Thus, she begins her mission to consume all of the gold she can. <laughs> That is one hungry mama. Well, wait, hold, hold up, but how is the gold giving her powers? D does she need it in order to survive? No, it's more like she's collecting it. Rita needs gold in order to form Goldar, her giant monster. So, so, so why does it need to be gold? Can't she just, like, javelin toss her staff to make things big like in the series? Uh, apparently not. They don't explain why Rita needs gold, either. It's just, she's got a giant monster, but it needs a theme, so gold! Huh. Just should've stuck with Pudgy Pig instead. That would've made things a lot simpler. 
Anyway, Jason shows up, as does everybody else, so they head back down to the command center to get guidance from Zordon. He points out, hey, not only are you Power Rangers, but you are mighty Morphin Power Rangers, which implies the ability to morph. Therefore, stand in this circle and tap into your true inner powers and morph! Morph, damn you! Which they don't. Alpha 5, why didn't they morph? I don't, I don't know, sir. It's, it's disturbing. Maybe because it isn't Saturday morning? I mean, does it literally have to be morph in time before it happens? Considering how Nickelodeon limits the number of episodes to 20 per season, they'd better get a move on. <sighs> Things were a hell of a lot easier back when Fox was in charge. Which is not something I expected to say when I got up this morning. Since the Rangers are having performance issues, in Jason's case, it could be due to the lack of burgers in the vicinity, Zordon has Alpha take them down to the pit for a training montage. And I gotta say, this is where the pacing in the film finally picks up. Yeah, about an hour in, mind you, but you're not wrong. Oh, this is exciting. <laughs> yeah, training. <laughs> Ready, Master Billy? <laughs> Oh, boy, do they have a training montage. What I said about the pacing starting to pick up? Well, this montage goes on for three straight minutes of film. And then Billy finds the Zeo Crystal. Wait, how? Also, what exactly is the Zeo Crystal? We got over two hours of exposition to work with. It's just something that helps, maybe makes a little sense. Do you really want me to explain that to you, Decker? Because you know I will. Uh, uh, okay, never mind the what. How about where? Followed very strongly by why? According to what I've been able to find, the director slash producers wanted the Zeo Crystal to be found under something mundane, something in everyday life. A rare example where the movie influenced the product placement instead of the other way around. In other words... Somebody thought that making Krispy Kreme the center of power for Earth in this universe was a good idea? Uh, yes. Yes, they did. And so much for the pacing flowing nicely, because we're back to... Well, I'll just say it. We gotta establish the Zords, so Alpha 5 just brings the folks back there and says, Hey, check out your Zords. They'll come in handy in Act 3. They take on the form of the most powerful organism on the planet. When these Zords formed, Dinosaurs reign supreme. Well then do you care to explain the Mastodon and Sabertooth Tiger? To say nothing of the Pterodactyl, at the very least we've got three different time periods to account for five different Zords. Oh god, we're back to Flintstones for history. Fortunately, none of that is all that important. Zack decides to take his Zord for a little joyride, breaking the rules, as well as several laws and environmental regulations in the process. This means he butts heads with the appointed leader, Jason, and they fight, which causes Billy to break them up and morph? Then demorph. Then Zordon talks about how disappointed he is that they can't morph, and we learn that's because he only intends to use their power to bring himself back to life. That's what all this has been about, right? You coming back? This has only ever been about protecting the crystal. And yet I'm still getting plot whiplash over here. So what are the Rangers gonna do about it? If I weren't stuck in this wall, I would be a jump. <laughs> Go camping, it looks like. That's some um, decisive team action right there. Billy steps forward during their little wiener roast, insisting that they need to share their deep, dark secrets with one another in order to unlock their morphing ability. Thank God they're not going with the Stephen King angle on this one. Let go of the Stephen King thing, Dicker. Billy's big reveal is all about liking country music. Oh, and he also blew up his locker using his lunchbox. Somehow. Zack is terrified of mortality, specifically his mother's, and what will happen to him when she's gone. Jason figures everyone in town already knows about his attempted theft of a bovine and car crash. Not about his friend jerking off a bull, though. That's probably for the best. That just leaves Trini's emotional baggage. Boyfriend troubles. Yeah. Girlfriend troubles? My family is so normal. Too normal. Okay, that didn't hit in any uncomfortable places. It's still better off than the bull. Let it go, Decker! The movie opened to a guy jerking on the bull. The American Pie didn't go that far. 
Kimberly asks if they can skip her turn, because the reason why she was in detention is... Uh, not so great. See, Kimberly's former friend, the one brandishing scissors in the girl's bathroom, showed Kim a naked photo of herself, which Kim then proceeded to use to humiliate her, and then she denied the whole thing, blaming her friend for orchestrating the whole ordeal as part of some big high school conspiracy. Yes, the character that everyone thinks of when they remember the classic Mighty Morphin Power Rangers era, excluding Tommy, of course, is in this incarnation a cyberbullying alpha bitch. Well, I mean... Oh, okay, yeah, that, that is pretty damn awful of her, but uh, does she at least learn her lesson? That's what you get. No. While they're learning how to be friends, or in Kim's case, or replacing old friends with new ones, Rita has been gaining power by collecting more gold, powering up, harassing jewelry store clerks, and then stops by Trini's place to supernaturally threaten her life! It strangely comes off as having far more sexual tension than Jason and Kimberly easily. Rita tells Trini that she could kill her, but... You will find out where that crystal is and you will come to me. We can have a little deal. Yes, I will kill you unless you bring me what I need to kill absolutely everyone, including you. Trini is not about to betray her friends, though, and because Rita told her exactly where to meet, she decides to tell the rest of the rangers, not betraying them, but coincidentally corralling all of them where Rita instructed, almost as if it were a trap. Right on time. Probably because it was a trap. And the body count rises! The body count rises! <laughs> the Cenobites, the body count finally rises. I guess so. I mean, Rita just landed on that nameless guy there. Hey, don't spoil this for me! And Rita just beats the crap out of all the Rangers. Seriously, this is a character whose big scene in each episode of the show was tossing her wand and making things grow. Wow, that really does sound Freudian. Here she takes no fucking prisoners, threatening the rangers' lives unless Billy reveals the secret of where the Zeo crystal is buried. Which she knows that he knows. Somehow. Crispy Green. This is a special place. Very special. It must be. Oh great, now she knows where the big power MacGuffin thing is. Well, I guess that means she doesn't need any of you anymore now, does it? Okay, one, first major character death is a black guy, not cool. Two, how's that supposed to kill him? He was underwater for maybe less than a minute? He's dead. I'm curious as to why she only murders the blue one. I mean, taking out the rest mean that there is literally nobody left to get in her way during the climax. I mean, if she watched the show, she would know this. What's the name? You just endorsed watching Power Rangers. My life has new meaning. Oh, crap. Well, uh, the Rangers decide to pick Billy up, which somehow is much harder than their earlier super strength would logically make it, and just walk his dead ass all the way down to the command center, asking Zordon to resurrect him. He kindly points out that that's really not how death works, but what's this? The Rangers are finally in sync, and the morphing grid is active. That means Zordon can come back from the dead. Except he doesn't. Only one can come back. Does that count as establishing something when you establish it literally less than one second before it's relevant? Barely, but it's still badly done. Well, who gives a shit because the Rangers are finally ready to morph! 90 minutes into the movie, which is when most movies are already over, they are now ready to morph. Is it bad that I'm missing the 1995 film suits right now? Like you've been saying, 105 million dollars. And this is what they went with. They could have just used Rita's amazing abilities to raise funds. She's out at the quarry because, as luck would have it, there's gold in them there hills. This means she has enough to finally finish creating Goldar, her monster thing. that 
kind of looks like a murderous sentient bowl of nacho cheese. I was gonna say Merun's Dagon after one too many mods. The punnies slow the rangers down as much as usual. As in, they don't, but once more we see where exactly the budget did go. Plus, it does pad the scene out for a bit while we wait for the rangers to remember they have Zords for the climax. Finally! Yes! They included the original themes! just happened. You used the original theme, the theme from the first Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie, for all of 13 seconds before you swapped it out for that? Creepy, creepy, calm down. They used the original theme song for 13 seconds before they swapped it out with this! Dear Lord, that's the loudest profanity I've ever heard. Well, anyway, the Rangers have their Zords now, and they- <laughs> Creepy! For the love- Take a breath before you pass out! Huh. With the Zords, which, despite being CGI, I have to admit look pretty damn good, at the very least compared to the first movie's attempt, the Rangers do battle with Golda! generally slamming into the monster in a desperate attempt to save the Krispy Kreme. They fight, and do battle, and continue to fight, which is uh, back and forth, knock down, drag out, no holds barred. Wow, man, they sure are going all out with the climax here. I have to concede, bearing questionable music choices, the last half hour of this movie is very entertaining. Yeah, it's just how long it takes to get there. Unfortunately, though, the Zords aren't quite as capable as Velveeta Kong over there, who slowly pushes all five of them down into a flaming pit of death. Which might have worked if it weren't for the fact that the Zords tend to do something when you put them all together like that. How? Wait a minute, they never did establish the Megazord existed before this. Alpha 5 didn't bring it up, Zordon didn't bring it up. The Zords didn't have little pamphlets under the seats telling to collect all five. Does this count as bad writing? Tacker, it's Power Rangers. Megazords are a thing. We know it, we expect it. Oh, hold on! In the first episode of Power Rangers, they established that the kids didn't have any problems piloting the Zords or the Megazord because they just kinda already knew how to do it. Hang on, you said you didn't watch Power Rangers as a kid. I, I, I mean, I caught the first few episodes, but still, does this count as bad writing? Huh, this is like Schrodinger's plot hole. The final confrontation between Rita and the Rangers is Goldar versus the Megazord, which is a pretty massive showdown, even if the Rangers pretty handily beat the crap out of the gold beast, pummeling it into an even pulpier pulp and spoiling Rita's plans. However, that doesn't mean any of this is over. Others will come. What you have? It can't last! Yes, Rita, we know. We get a giant monster every week. Or maybe I could just pimp slap her into space. Wonder why the original Rangers never tried that. It would have ended the franchise, just like with this movie. Nevertheless, the day is saved. The Rangers have triumphed, and are all in better places emotionally and mentally. Trini is getting along better with her family, Zack's mother appears to be improving, Billy has friends now, Kim has really not learned anything, and Jason's dad is implied to know that his son is the Red Ranger thanks to Jason saving his life during Rita's rampage. So, happy ending! Tommy Oliver. Tommy Oliver. Oh, fuck, of course there would be sequel bait. Well, you don't have to worry about that this time around. Not until the reboot, anyway. The hell? I, 
You know, never mind. Anyway, that was Saban's Power Rangers. And I liked it better than Turbo. Wait, that really doesn't say anything. Well, for starters, yeah, I'm still not the most knowledgeable about Power Rangers, and I don't know if that helped or not. I can easily accept all these characters as Rangers, Rita, Zordon, and, well, let's not talk about the biomechanoid nightmare prattering about. However, that doesn't mean that I thought this was a fantastic flick. There are quite a few things this movie does that are kind of at odds with itself. The pacing likes to jump back and forth a lot. Yes, there are five main characters, and each of them deserves to have a decent backstory and family life so you can get attached to them. But this is often done at the expense of the story's flow. Not only that, but it also makes the first half of the movie, where we get all of our establishing points out of the way, very long, leading to another issue where, yes, it's a Power Rangers movie, but we watch an entire feature-length film without the Power Rangers before even getting to that part. Overall, Saban's Power Rangers is a well-shot and entertaining action flick for the last half of the movie. The first half isn't necessarily bad for what it is, but going back and forth so much just leaves my brain in a fog and trying to remember the characters' relationships with one another has me thinking in white noise. Still, I feel the whole package earns three extremely happy kidnapped bulls out of five. To me, this movie feels amateurish. And I don't mean that amateur films automatically equal bad. There are plenty of examples of amateur films that are moving, even impressive on a special effects scale, considering what they have to work with. No, Power Rangers feels amateurish when it has no right to be. The actors working on this are not neophytes. The director in charge isn't fresh out of college. And I cannot state it enough, a hundred and five million dollar budget! No, I'm not over that! The pacing is terrible. The editing feels clumsy at best. The acting for the first 45 minutes is underwhelming. Like with Turbo, the Rangers do not morph into their power suits until 90 minutes into the movie. At least two of the Rangers aren't very likable. The characters who are likable are out of focus. Save for Billy, of course. And the movie drags for so long in so many places that the big climax at the end isn't worth waiting around for. Also, the plot somehow has too much time to focus on the characters, while also leaving me feeling as if the characters aren't developed enough. There's also the fact that quite a lot doesn't get explained very well. And when things are explained, they wind up not being important. Rita and Zordon are said to have had this rivalry between them ever since she betrayed the last group of rangers that were on Earth, and yet this never amounts to anything. Zordon isn't freed from the spaceship wall he's stuck in. Rita never finds the command center, at any point. There's no big confrontation between the two, which feels unfulfilling given how many hints were dropped throughout about the fact that Rita could have had good reason for betraying Zordon and that Zordon might not have been completely honest with the Rangers about everything that went down. It's unsatisfying, and poor writing. When a movie with a budget of over a hundred million dollars has poor writing, there's no excuse. That said, there are good things to be found in this film. The acting does pick up after the 45 minute mark. Elizabeth Banks looks as though she's having the time of her life hamming it up on camera. There are also good character moments throughout the film, and several of the characters do pair off well together. Trini and Kimberly have really good scenes together. Same with Jason and Billy. The larger issue is how the Rangers don't gel together as a group. The moment when they come together following Billy's death doesn't feel earned. They haven't really connected the way that they should, so it's more like the plot is forcing things along to keep the story moving. Overall, Saban's Power Rangers is a mess. It's not a terrible film. We've seen bad films before. We know what those are like. We know what Decker looks like yelling about bad films. But it is a disappointing film. The signs for a great movie were all over the place, but they weren't utilized well. Bringing it to two and a half pterodactyl blades out of five. I liked Rita's green butt. Of course she did. Thank you all for watching. Ah, uh, we've talked about this creepy. <clears throat> Thank you all for watching. I have been Decker Shadow. And remember... Maybe giving teenagers with emotional problems, superpowers, advanced tech, and giant robots to pilot isn't such a good idea. Just a thought, Zordon. Good night, everybody.
Did you just slap me? I did. <laughs>